Please let this phrase sink deep within. The church exists to make much, not of the church, but of Christ. And this should matter to you. And now let's apply it. This church exists to make much, not of this church, but of Christ. And that should make a difference in your life, practically, tangibly. These matters are concerning a glorious reality, the church. I want to begin a short series on the church. And we've entitled this, A People for God. And in this short time, our purpose is going to be to renew the mind of the church. You are a people for God. You are a people for God. And here's the need for the renewal. We are, while being a people for God, we are a forgetful people in a land of distractions. I dare say that we probably live in a day when there are more distractions than the church has ever had. We are a forgetful people in a land of distractions. Our minds are easily captivated by trivial and temporary inducements. New things quickly become old and even even the mind's eye, even in the mind's eye, glory fades. What at once might have been glorious to us and induce us with great joy and enthusiasm and zeal has still the capacity in our being, in this fallen place, to fade. It's as though we are a forgetful people of, of, of such moving realities. Here's the thing. Our forever union with Christ is presently invisible. And our temporary connection to this passing world is always in our face, visible. So it's no small wonder that we as a people for God are in need of constant renewal. We live in need of constant renewal. And this isn't just individual. Often we listen with an ear of self. Often we listen with an eye to self. Often we listen as though it's just about us, the grand scheme of redemption, the glories of the gospel, and these principles of renewal. What is true for the individual mind is true for the mind of the church. We as a church need to be renewed in the truths of who we are. This is a series that seeks to renew then the mind of the church. Not so much... Not so much renew the mind of duty, responsibility, commission, what you must do. Not so much what you are called to do, but more what you are called. Who you are. This is always the first step in true living to understand who you are. Your identity, the significance that God places upon you. It's a beautiful thought, really. A lovely thought. It's one of the most lovely that we could ever set our hearts upon. We who are a church are a people for God and none other. None other. There was a book written not long ago that the title of it was Cinderella with amnesia. This glorious princess. This beautiful bride. Forgets. Who she is. Forgets. What she's been given. Remember. Your identity. You are a people. For God. Now, there's a lot that that means. Those words are chosen carefully. And my prayers over the next few weeks will unfold some more of it. 
Today, let's begin with where I think we ought to just begin, and that is then the substance of who we are as a church. Today, let us begin with this amazing vision of beauty and glory. We must always begin there. Why? Because, well, very simply, your practice will never rise above your perception. So what you do will never rise above what you understand you are. So let's begin there with the perception, with the vision of something beautiful, not a vision of wishful thinking or imagination, but a vision that is revealed in Scripture, a vision that God wants us all to see. I asked you to go to Ephesians 1 because we're going to go back there, but let's just, let's preface our text with Ephesians 5. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What I'd like to do is in a Puritan fashion present the exposition in a form of doctrine and and application. I'd like to ask us to see, this is not a normal exposition that I'm used to. I'm going to use the text primarily with a limited view to the particular subject of the church as the bride of Christ. So let us look at this now with at least these three statements. One, the foundational statement is that the church is beloved as a bride. We will then see that in this passage, it's very clear that the church is beloved to become beautiful. And then we will see that the church is beloved to be loved more. Let's take them one step at a time. Most of our time will be in this first one. Most of our time is in understanding that the church is beloved as a bride. My my burden, my, my joyful burden for this church that I love and for all local churches is to communicate just how powerful, how precious the words of Christ are, the depictions that he gives of his affection for you. How powerful he depicts his affection for you. And there is no more lovely and and vivid portrayal than the brilliant metaphor that paints the church as a bride. It's captivating. It's marvelous. It's stirring. The bride is dearly beloved. She is beloved beyond what she naturally sees or senses. You as a church are loved more than any of you sense. More than any of you can see. You're dearly beloved. She is not defined by herself. She's not defined by other people. She's not defined by other institutions. She's not defined by imagination. She's not defined by her performance. She's not defined by what she makes herself. She's defined by the one who loves her. And his love determines her destiny. His love defines and creates her beauty. She has loved more than she senses. She has loved more than she sees. She is something, the church. She is something far more wonderful than she presently knows. She is pursued by Christ and she is preserved by Christ. She is beloved as his wife. She is the bride. 
the bride of Christ. Now, I want to get into the text. Oh, I'm anxious. But I, I must preface to connect us with, this, with our world and, and the state of the church today. I can't spend a great deal of time, but I do want to just encourage you. There are so many quotes I had to put aside. So many quotes because I knew it would just take the whole sermon. Giving you quotes of what is being written in books out there. There's an end. Do you know? Do you know? There is an anti-church spirit today. There's an anti-church spirit among professing Christians. I'm not talking about the world and what they say. I'm talking about Christian writers. People who profess Christ, who've been in the church for decades, write things like, I, I, I do not believe in organized religion anymore. I do not need the church to be a Christian. The numbers, of course, tell a bit of the story, don't they? How many people in America claim to be Christian as compared to how many people are committed to a local church? Well, the number that claim to be Christian is far greater. And not only that, let's just add our current situation. It wasn't but just a couple years ago that COVID exposed the weakness of people's commitment. It exposed the impoverished view of the church. It didn't create the problem. It exposed the problem. The issues that we've been dealing with since then and throughout have only been increasingly, well, politics dividing the church. Culture dividing the church. Cultural issues Church state understanding dividing the church. It seems that everything is amassed against the beauty, the glory, the wonder, the, the value, the preciousness of the church. You know, the, dis, the most disheartening factor in the whole movement of this anti church spirit moving to say, well, we don't need organized religion, we don't need churches, we certainly don't need church buildings. We're just Christians. We need Christ. There's a quote out there that just drives me crazy that says, people are leaving the church and returning to God. The most devastating and disheartening factor in it all, in the whole movement, is the glaringly obvious spirit of individualism, of personal autonomy, and even the species of anarchy. You boil it all down and you won't find biblical reasons compelling this way of thinking. Overthrowing what we're doing right now. You won't find it biblically. You boil it all down and what you'll find instead, you'll find proud people opposing authority, bucking order, and rejecting submission. And some of this is understandable in that human experience presents so many reasons why people feel this way. But right there is the fatal flaw. The church is not defined by your experience. There's all this talk about revolution in the church. About great new movements. As though there's something that needs to be done that the Bible doesn't tell us. As though the church is stagnant and dying. And we need something more than the scriptures. To be, well, to be Christian. It's fascinating. Human experience creates those thoughts. 
Human experience and perspective creates those thoughts. You're not going to find from scripture the compelling reasons to go this way. Now, I, I, I said I understand why people feel that way, why they think that way, because there are so many tragic abuses of power, abuses of position, abuses of property, of wealth, of money in the church. There's so many, so many abuses. It's no wonder that people are hurt and saying, that's the problem. It's the building. The, it's the organization. That's the problem. Let me just close this statement about the movement of this anti-Christian, anti-institutional, anti-religious movement. The wrongs of others never justify our own. So when abuses occur in the church of Christ, we should not throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater and say, the problem is in the building. The problem is in having a pastor. The problem is in paying money. The problem is in all whatever else you want to put, organization. The problem is in the style. Whatever label you want that's being attacked out there, they're missing the substance. Let me make it plain. The organized church is Christ's idea not man's. I fear also that there's this sense whenever you see this happening where you see pastors leaving organized churches and starting some kind of grassroots home movement or writing books to criticize the church and overthrow the church, dethrone or, or remove preaching, talk about emergence and conversation, talk about all these different manners of, of, of practicing Christianity, supposedly. They often, often, not, not just sometimes, they always and often cited in their thinking that, well, the church in the Bible was this amazing power. In fact, one writer says that once Constantine took over, the church stopped being a movement and became a monument. Meaning it was kind of, then it's statued, it's just dead. Organized religion entered in. And what was a movement died. And the writer is saying, I'm calling for revolution and I want a movement again. So let's throw off the church and have a movement it's fascinating that they tend to romanticize the church in the Bible, the early church. They tend to idealize the early church. Like we want to be like the early church. It was, it was so powerful. Their love was so strong. Their witness was so clear. They, they rocked the world. They, they transformed society. They, it's so clear. I want that. But what we're doing doesn't do that. Are you with me? Are you tracking? This is how they think. This is what they say. This is what they want you to believe. And some of you believe it. But here's the thing. Whenever they write that, whenever they, they romanticize about the non-building church, the churches that didn't meet in buildings, the church that, that wasn't institutionalized, whenever they talk about that, I, I wonder... Have they read 1 Corinthians? We're talking the church had heretics. It had apostates. It had sexual immorality. It had fighting. It had abuses. It had gossip. It had all sorts and manners of wickedness. All over the place. It had doubts. It had fears. It had ungodliness and worldliness. Have you looked at the majority of what the New Testament epistles write about? 
You know, think about it with me. Just think about it with me. They don't write about the Great Commission. They write about the church. They write about who she is and what she ought to be thinking, how she ought to be. Everything else will follow. And so when we think about romanticizing and idealizing the early church, I think, I think right away we've already created a church in our own ideal imagination. It's never been that way. So don't get caught in the trap of glory days. Oh, if only we were like then. Seize the day today. The church of Jesus Christ is alive today. Not because of how great we are. Not because of our smarts or our abilities or tools or resources or knowledge. No, because the same God yesterday, today, and forever is ruling his church. And he loves her. And he's doing today what he did in the first century. Don't despise, don't despise the day of small things. And don't despise the thinking that maybe, oh, this church, we just can't, we're just not big enough. We don't have the influence. We don't have... Are you kidding me? Entire books of the New Testament, entire epistles are written to churches that are half this size. Seriously. And they rock the world. Where did it all begin? Did they obey better? No, no, no. I think they had a larger glimpse that they were the bride. They had this greater apprehension of this beauty. Let's just put away the idea. I love what Kevin DeYoung says. He says, really? You, uh, there's all these arguments against the buildings, right? And spending money on buildings. Well, really? Um, so he, uh, he says, so you really think that it was buildings that caused the wheels to fall off the church? It was buildings. Is that, is that your view of the church? Is that how low the view of the church is? That it could be something so simple as structure, as formalities, as, pre, as preferences. That, that, that's the problem. That's the problem. No, I'll tell you what the problem is in this church and the problem in every church in the world. It's one simple word, three letters long, starts with S, ends with N, and it, in the middle of it all is I, myself, and me. Sin is the problem, not structure. So let's just now think about what the local church is because when we think about this statement that Christ loved the church, I am, I am saying with unashamed passion and gratitude and joy and zeal and worship that, that when God says he loves the church, he doesn't mean some ideal, romanticized, abstract, ethereal concept. He's talking about the local church. The local church. The one that's being criticized all the time. That one. He's talking about that one. What is this local church? Let me just do a, a run through of thought. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. This is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples, the apostles, the directly sent by Christ. Peter preaches a message. The gospel goes forth, pierces the hearts of men and women. They repent of their sin and they, they thrust their souls to Christ. They ask, what must we do to be saved? They're told to repent, to believe, to be baptized, to identify with him. And the text says this. So those who received the word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's a statement about the local church. In verse 47, just a few verses later, it says that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In chapter 5, it talks about how great fear came upon the church, the local church, the, the church in Jerusalem, that local church, massive growing body of people. It says fear fell upon them. And then in verse 14, it says more than ever believers were being added. And then it says this. It's added to them, but being added to them was being added to the Lord. Let's not forget the connection. Local church, being added to the local church through the gospel to spiritual reality, not an external membership. Spiritual reality, coming to Christ through the gospel, immediately results in being connected with other people who also came to Christ through the gospel. 
that's the local church. And that local church, as it grows, it talks in terms of being added to Christ. So close is the union between the bride and the husband. Well, in chapter 6, verse 7, it says, The word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. And there's the evidence. Every time it talks about increase, it's not talking abstract. It's not talking some pie in the sky or universal church of, of spirits. It's talking about the local church. And and here, when we think about this, just think about the presentation of the New Testament, the New Covenant. Think about it. You got the first four books, the Gospels. This is the presentation of the bridegroom. Then you've got Acts. This is the making of the bride. Then you've got all the letters. In all the letters, these are the letters of love from the bridegroom to the bride. And then you've got Revelation, which is the glorious hope and promise and certainty of the consummation of the marriage. It's all right there. The picture is abundantly clear. The bride comes on the scene, or the bridegroom comes on the scene, and he says, I've come for a bride. He makes her an ax. He writes to her in all the letters, and he gives a vision for what the end of the story is like. And there's no coincidence that The last two chapters of Revelation talk about the church as a bride. So this is a glorious and beautiful picture. And let us remember that it is the local church that we're talking about. John Stott wisely says that in the book of Acts, we never see anyone saved without being added to the local church. So put away the silly thoughts of some kind of Lone Ranger Christian, a churchless Christianity, movements, and not church, put it away. You're not going to find it in Scripture. The Scripture is abundantly clear that being connected to Christ in union with Christ only happens when we are truly, even if we don't realize or sense or are committed as we should be, when we are committed, when we are in union with others who are in union with Christ. Let me give you some biblical data on this. What church is a local church? What is a local church? I'll tell you what a local church is not. A local church is not a few Christians hanging out. A local church is not Christians gathering together over a meal, fellowshipping, visiting. A local church is not a few Christians praying. A local church is not even a Bible study. What is a local church? There are a few basic and important parameters that really help to define this. Number one is gathering. A local church is a gathering body of Christians. It's a gathering. In Acts 14, 27, it says, when they arrived and gathered the church together. The gathering is the key of the ecclesia, of the called out ones to assemble. And that, by the way, is opposed In Acts 20, it's shown that when you have a representative of the church, it doesn't mean you have the church. Because in Acts 20, verse 17, Paul is seen here as calling from Miletus, sending to Ephesus, the very very church we're reading about, calling to them the elders. It doesn't say when the elders came and that plurality of men, the church was there. No. No. The elders came on official church business. They were specifically set apart for this committed church. They were there to communicate realities of the church, everything about the church. And yet it wasn't the church. So just gathering people is not the church. Not only this, we find clear statements. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church. Did you hear that language? Okay, that language is unmistakable. It's not saying when you come together, you are a church. It's saying when you come together as a church. There's something very particular about right now. The gathering, the corporate gathering, the assembly of the church. This first attribute is a gathering that defines the local church. It's a gathering. And in fact, that's where we get the word in church. 1 Corinthians 14, 19, Paul says, Nevertheless, in church, 
I would rather, and he goes on to describe something. That speaks of in the sphere, when the church is gathered, when I'm in there, there's something that changes. There's something that I'm now under a different mode of operation. In just a few verses later, he says, the whole church comes together. If therefore the whole church comes together, there's the assembly. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He says, whenever the church meets, either as a whole or representatively, there is a solemn dignity cast about that assembly, which is not to be found in a parliament of kings and princes. We don't see it. We don't sense it. But the gathering right now is something beautiful. It's the first trait, really, of the bride. She gathers together. Let me go through these others more quickly. She gathers. Distinctive marks of a local church gathering. Number two is they read scripture publicly. This is said multiple times. 1 Timothy 4, 13, Colossians 4, 1 Thess 5, 2 Thess 3. Over and over and over we're told, read the scriptures publicly. Christians get together and the assembly of the local church reads the scriptures. Not only reads them, but preaches them. 1 Timothy 4, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture and to exhortation and teaching. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ in 2 Timothy 4. He says to preach the word in season and out of season. And the context is to the church. In Titus 2.15, declare these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you in the church. So preaching is in the church is another mark. You have gathering. You have this very important principle of reading the scripture and of preaching the scripture. But not only that, you have also praying. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to their teaching, and to the prayers, to the fellowship, and to the prayers. So they pray publicly. They gather corporately to pray in one heart with one voice. Also, the church, the local church, is a singing church. We'll talk more about that in the coming week. But a singing church, think of it this way. The picture to me is beautiful and compelling. You've got Christ, the bridegroom, creating a bride. And he loves her. And the message today is about just how much he loves her. And what what is her instinctive response to such love? A heart that sings. So it's a a people who gather together and sing to make much of Christ. Expressing the glories of grace through the gospel. It's a church, a a gathering of Christians who, who come together for all these things. Not only to gather, not only to read scripture, not only to preach scripture, not only to pray, not only to sing. But also to observe and to affirm one another through the observation of the ordinances. Through baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are things given to her to do so that she could observe them, so that she could affirm one another and encourage one another, building one another up in their most holy faith. A local church is a church that gathers and and gives. 2 Corinthians 9 is unavoidable. And elsewhere, it talks about 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about, or 10, it talks about them coming together and and giving. They're, they're, They're giving from them their own resources for the good of the church. It's so central in their life. Loving and serving, it's all over the place. Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, on and on, we're told that that there are varied gifts and they're given for the purpose to serve one another. Serving one another in love. Galatians 5 says, so serve one another in love. That's what the church does. That's what a local church is. It's gathering, reading scripture, preaching scripture, praying, singing. It's giving, it's loving, it's observing the ordinances, and it has officers. This is very clear, Acts 14, 23, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, elders plural, in every church, singular. The point? That is necessary. Structure is Christ's idea, not ours. That there is a necessity for a duly appointed and accountable, spiritually mature, humble shepherd to be caring for the flock, to be loving and leading. 
This is the model of Christ himself. And he says, I've appointed you to follow after me in this way. Peter, do you love me? Then do it this way. And he gave us this legacy. There should be duly appointed officers in the church. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. I love how Paul says it there. I left you there in that city of Crete. Why? So that you might put what remained into order. Those who want to reject organization, organized religion, then what in the world does Paul mean when he says, I left you there to put what remained to be put in order. It's not complete. The church is incomplete without this order. So be careful about little phrases and statements that want to buck organization. It's not our idea. It's Christ's. Or how about this, that the local church is also a body of believers in the fear of God by the power of the Spirit, directed by the light of His Word in Christ, in Christ alone, who make decisions. They gather in meetings, like in Acts 15. They gather together to listen and to make a decision and to be of one mind and say, this is the way we will go. Or they gather together to ordain new leaders. In the presence of all, what's the all? The all is the local church. In the presence of all, ordaining the new, laying on hands. Or how about sending missionaries? This happened repeatedly, Acts 15, 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 8, 23, on and on. That they, the local church gathered together, hear testimony, pray over, lay hands upon and send out. Supporting and sending and bearing witness Everywhere they go. But when they gather, when they gather, that's when they are the bride. When they gather. You know, there's an interesting thing in science. We say like H2O is water. Technically, that's not true. You know that? H2O is not water. H2O is a molecule. You know what water is? Water is only a collection of H2O molecules. Listen to this. You're not the bride individually. You're just a molecule. The bride of Christ is all of you together. And let's not confuse the idea of universal church, local church. What does that mean? How does it work? I mean, is it those who've gone before us in heaven, cloud of witnesses? Is it all the churches around the world. What, what is the bride of Christ? Let me tell you, just simple, just simple. In Acts 14, it makes it very simple. He says, in the body, there are many members and you are the body of Christ. And he's talking to one church, local church. You know what that means? You are the body of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. What does that mean? That means a local church is not an arm of the universal, but rather a model of it. The local church is the model of the church. It's, it's the little miniature. It's the model. That means every local church is to be a complete model. A complete model of the bride. And therefore, every local church that is true in Christ is dearly beloved. Dearly beloved. I took you through that exercise to remind us we are talking about the local church that Christ loves, the local church that gathers together with Scripture leading by the power of the Spirit in all of these ways that we've discussed with freedom and form in the corporate expression, with older folks and younger, younger folks, with this wonderful diversity that is beautiful with all these differences in background, all these differences in every way you can possibly think, all the demographics are shot through. And we come together as a family. All of our differences are put aside. And we come together like molecules to make water, to be beautiful to Christ. The, the, the picture is amazing and I want us to think, when we, when we study the church, I, I can't deny that we are studying, it's a study in paradoxes. It is. I mean, we're talking about we are the body of Christ and yet we are the bride of Christ. That's a paradox. Or we are chosen 
And yet we are striving to be devoted. We are individually saved and we are corporately saved. We are an earthly organization, but yet we are a heavenly organism. We are local and yet universal. So it is a study in paradoxes, but make this clear. Let's just deal with how God presents us the model. The local gathering of the church is the model of the bride of Christ. And true Christianity means not only believing in Christ, but belonging to Christ and those who are Christ's. Union sets up a wonderful portrayal of marriage. Union with Christ implicates the church as a bride. And altogether, she is united to him. And the two shall become one. Isn't that where Paul's going to end our passage? This mystery is profound. A truth once concealed, now revealed. It's profound. It's not like God created the church and then said, man, what can I look? Looks all high and low for an illustration. Says, oh, marriage, that could do it. No, 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 no. Ephesians 1, 4 tells me that it was before the foundation of the world that he chose a bride. Which means before he created marriage, he had the church in mind. Which means when he created marriage between mortals, it's not like that was the superior and the church is the end. No, it was, I have the church in mind. This is what I'm after. The hall of redemptive history is going to this end. So I will create an institution on earth that they might be able to taste. Just a taste of what I'm doing through my son. So the issue I'm after is belonging to Christ's church in turn means belonging to a local church. It is both a privilege and a responsibility. It is that the the supremacy of Christ as seen in his redemptive purposes for a bride. And every local church is a model of that bride. So the church, the local church, is not an accessory. You know, some people live it like that. As though it's an accessory. I would say, for us, it's no more an accessory than the body is an accessory to a cell. Each member needs the church. Or to Christ, it's no more an accessory. The church is no more an accessory than a wife is an accessory to marriage. The church is not an accessory. It's integral. It's significant. It's profoundly important. This is the magnificence. Now let's go back to Ephesians 1. And I want to show you. Look at verse 4. 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he, tell me, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And then he describes how in love he predestined us, in love he chose us with a prevailing love, a love that will overcome all obstacles. And we often read that and think about that as though it were talking just about an individual. But every pronoun there is plural. And the image that is clearly in mind that comes to fruition in chapter 5 is a bride. After all, the language of choosing is clearly the ancient language of a man choosing his wife. So, The magnificence begins right there. But look over at 22, verse 22. And he, that is the father, put all things under his, that is the son's feet, and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is now a gift. The father arranges a marriage. And the father gifts his son with a precious bride. And places him as head over the church and declares the church to be this amazing thing, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's as though she becomes united to him 
who fills everything so that she becomes exalted in this profound way. It's amazing to me. It's totally and completely thrilling. The father placed all things under the feet of Christ and then gave Christ head over all things to the church. And what is the purpose of that grammar? Paul paints a portrait of the lordship of Christ over all creation and then gives it to the church to remind her, to remind her of him. He paints the picture that your husband is king over all and I'm going to give that picture to you, church. Remember that. That's who loves you. That's who loves you. He's the king. Look not to yourself. Don't spend time in the mirror. Look to the portrait of your husband who loves you. That's where it's going. The language is indeed too big for us. These are realities that are too large for us to see. So it requires faith as we hear these things. It is amazing to me. It's beautiful how Christ cherishes the church. This is the God who created everything for his glory whose majesty is far beyond all comprehension, whose grandeur is without limitation, for he fills everything, and yet he has put all things at the feet of the Son. Because Christ has conquered every God-opposing force by dying in the place of his enemies, satisfying justice and securing judgment, and thereby, Colossians 2 says, canceling the record of debt that stood against us to make us his bride. That's what it means, putting everything under his feet. So through this same suffering, through his sacrificial death, he has forever silenced every just accusation against his wife. you hear that? That's the point. You can't say anything against his wife. He put it all under his feet. His wife is precious. Don't say anything against her. This is a testimony that the church ranks highest of all creation. She receives the most valuable treasure Ever. The church receives Christ. She receives Christ. Now look over at chapter 3. Look at how the progression goes. Verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Actually, I meant 19. Look at 19 with me. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, echoing what he already said about Christ. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. This is not merely stately diction. It extols a transcendence of importance. It says this amazing thing about the church, that the glory of Christ, the glory of Christ is to be revealed to all generations in the church. It's as though he's saying the church is so much a part of the whole redemptive purpose that apart from the church, the collective body of people redeemed by my blood. He has no glory to be seen in this world. But when, when the church sees that she is so loved, she then realizes, no, wait, wait, this is who I am. I'm the one appointed by God to display the glory of Christ in this world. Where else are they going to see the glory of Christ? Where else are they going to see the gospel in all this Lone Ranger stuff? Preaching on curbs? Is that where? No, they'll see it right here. In something beautiful. In a new humanity. In something to sing about. In a gathering people who love and serve one another so that the world may know who they belong to. That they're a bride. They're precious. They're loved. And even when they're beat down, they get back up. With swollen lips, black eyes, and blood. They come back and they sing. And why do they do it? It's the only way to show the world 
the glory of Christ in the gospel. The local church is the only church the world sees. Right? And so the local church is something so incredibly precious. Christ loves her. Now, our text, 525. I've got like five minutes. It's all right. 520. Christ loves the church. Let's start. I've started this point. Number one is that we are beloved as a bride. It's so evident. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ did not love or give himself up for any other institution, not the family, not anything else in this whole world. He gave himself up for the church. The church is not a parenthesis in redemptive history. It is a glorious bride, precious plan before the foundation of creation. The church is founded by Christ, Matthew 16. The church will prevail against all enemies. The church is purchased with the blood of God, Acts 20. And if any man, here as we see as a bride, if any man can even begin to understand the beauty of loving his wife, he has only tasted the starting point picture of how Christ loves the church. And you collectively are the church. I fail to be able to convey to you how much Christ loves you. You are precious to him. The best marriage this earthly realm has ever seen is but a dark and broken shadow of how much this glorious and perfect and all-powerful, beautiful groom loves you. The highest of loves that you could ever experience in this realm is only but the starting point taste of what this means. We are loved as a bride. Jonathan Edwards nails it. He says, the whole world was created so that the eternal son of God might obtain a spouse. He says, so that the mutual joys between the bride and the groom are the whole end, purpose, object of creation. Spurgeon says, on earth, he exercises towards her all the affection offices of a husband. He makes rich provision for her wants and pays all her debts and allows her to assume his name and to share in all his wealth. Edwards again says, Christ in, is divine wisdom so that the world is made to gratify divine love as exercised by Christ or to gratify the love that is in Christ's heart or to provide a spouse for Christ. Those creatures which wisdom chooses for the object of divine love is Christ's own elected wife. Oh, it is so beautiful to think of Christ Loving us that way. So I pray, turn your eyes away from, away from your low standing in the eyes of the world. And turn your eyes to the indescribable standing in the eyes of Christ. For after all, what people think of the church in the end, doesn't matter. What the husband thinks is all that matters. So even our low thoughts, let us turn away from them. Let us repent of those. And let us turn to see the portrait. And let us remember also, in this world, we are married, we are united to one who was rejected by men and despised, forsaken. And so therefore we ought to remember that though he was despised and forsaken, he was precious in the sight of God. And so are you. And so are you. Well, obviously this is not flattery. But it is something that is a call to see something great and beautiful and larger than we can. My prayer is that you would see that the church is central. A couple of thoughts on this centrality of the church. You know, when we think about our family life, when we think about our social life, our vocational life, our educational life, 
We tend to prioritize those things and the church becomes an accessory. As though those things come first and by those things being good and right, they'll feed into a good and right church. And it's all backward. You can't live by sight. The church must be central. The church must be first. After all, Christ said, if you love mother and father more than me, you're not worthy of me. And whatever, therefore, if we see Christ as supreme over all things, then what he values most is what we must value most. He reorders our priorities. And so then it becomes this, not the question, how, how does, how does the church fit into all my priorities, but rather how do all my priorities fit into the church? Do we think like that? Do we see the church like that? I challenge you, think about it. God loves the church with a love too deep for human imagination. He loves her with all his infinite heart. Spurgeon says, this is true. Let me close this. Literally, I'll blast through these last two observations, but I want you to look at the text with me. Look at Ephesians 5 and where he goes. Number two, not only is the church beloved as a bride, but the church is beloved to become beautiful. There's a purpose clause. He gave himself up for her, 25, so that, verse 26, he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself. So he beautifies the church. Luther talks about an example of a peasant girl in Germany, uh, under monarchies, right? Where a king would come down and choose this peasant girl. She had nothing to offer. She had nothing to stand in her own for confidence in this relationship. She she really brought nothing to it. It was completely a a miracle that the king would choose her. And it wasn't for her beauty. Isn't that the point? Christ gave himself so that he could make her beautiful. Not because she was beautiful, So the peasant was made a princess. She was made beautiful. He set his heart on her and made her something she was not. Isn't that the point of Ephesians when it starts out before the foundation of the world? He chose you. And he chose you for this end to sanctify, to beautify. There's an old Jewish custom where before the wedding, you take a bath, you wash yourself the wife, this bride, would wash herself. Sometimes that would take a year. Go back and read Esther chapter two. Take a year. You do this over and over and over and over with all these perfumes and all this. It'd take a long time to beautify so that you can be presented to the groom. That's what Paul's talking about. The church is washed, but she's washed. How? Well, first of all, he gave himself to her and then he preached a word, the word being the gospel As he preached that word, it changed her heart and mind. And now she's being prepared, set apart from the world to be this beautiful, beautiful bride. And that's, in fact, right where I want to bring us to in the last point. And then we'll get application in just a few statements. The last thing is we are, as a church, beloved to be loved more. Isn't that the point when he says, The purpose clause in 26 was to make her beautiful so that verse 27 gives another purpose, a purpose that stands on top of that purpose. It wasn't to make her beautiful to be beautiful. It was to make her beautiful so that he could present her to himself. And then he adds yet another purpose so that when he presents her to herself, she will be holy and blameless, which connects to chapter one, verse four, right? Chose us before the foundation of the world so that we who are in Christ might be holy and blameless. Same words that he uses here. And what's the point about that? What's the point about that? It's that he loves holiness. He loves beauty. He loves glory. And we're not there yet. We're not there yet. You are beloved as a bride, but right now we're not there yet. We're not presented to him yet. 
Right now we're in that period where we've heard the word. It's, it's come over us and we know it to be sure. And we, so much so that we left, we left family and country and now we're in a bath. And we're getting ready to be presented. And every, every day, every year that the calendar clicks, we're waiting. We can't wait to be presented to this glorious husband. So he delights to sanctify us. He delights to, he loves us to make us beautiful and he loves us so that he could delight in us more. And there's so many scriptures I had to show how God promises that he will delight over you. He will rejoice in you. You are so precious and so beautiful and such a a part. Now this is the problem. And I've got to close this with this. I've got to bring us. You don't see it. You don't sense it. I know, I've been in the church long enough to know that we hurt each other. We disappoint each other. We fail each other. We don't show up. We don't follow through. We fail to smile and greet. We say things that hurt. We are unkind. We criticize, we gossip, we say offensive things, we demonstrate partiality and cliques and we're not there yet. Many churches live their life like an ugly duckling, all depressed because they just aren't beautiful. You don't know. You're the most beautiful of all his creation. You're just in preparation right now. What's the way to get out of this? How do we implement this change? How do we overcome? Well, creatures have this, well, this, 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 we can't get away from becoming what we love most. The key to the change is that every human, every, every saint in the church, every molecule in the water needs to be cleaned. And set their eyes on Christ. What we're saying, all I have is Christ, is the point. That's how the church becomes beautiful. When we stop looking horizontally in complaint, and criticism, and comparisons. And when we start all together singing with one heart, the glories and the praises and the worth and the value and the loveliness and the beauty of Christ. It's then, when we make much of Christ together, it's then that we will change from one degree of glory to another, becoming more and more beautiful so that Christ would delight in us all the more. Are you with me? I thank you for your patience. I pray that you hear that the church exists to make much not of the church. This isn't about us cleaning ourselves up. This isn't about us being a better church than other churches. This is about every one of us realizing just how significant it is for us to gather in the name of Christ, with commitment, devotion, with our hearts singing with one voice that all I have is Christ. He is the church's one foundation. He came, he came to purchase us, even us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the preciousness of the church And I pray what I cannot give. I pray that you would would enlarge our view. I pray that you would bless each one. Help them to see how this applies. How they might greet one another. How they might be kind to one another. How they might reach out to one another. How they might serve one another with humility and love. And patience and forbearance. How they might see one another as part of something so much bigger than self-interest. Oh, how each one in this room might truly walk out built up knowing that they are so loved. It's beyond what they understand. And that rather than trying to look for a perfect church or trying in in their own strength to be a perfect church, rather would they, would us all humble ourselves to set our gaze on Christ and him alone, that in Christ we might be shaped more and more 
into his likeness. May we love Christ more so that we can become more beautiful for his glory, for our joy and the joy of all through us. We pray in his holy name. Amen.